praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Let us worship God this morning. for his amazing grace anybody grateful for his amazing grace thank you Lord i 
God bless you for being here. Um, can I borrow that mic? Is that live? <clears throat> We're going to read some scripture and pray together. Um, but in the midst of just saying, praise God, praise God, Fred Ravel, his wife Janet is with him here today. Fred's been with First Priority for years and years. I'm going to put you on the spot, buddy. I apologize. Come on up here real quick. Fred, give him a big hand. Fred and... Uh, If, uh, if Christianity was the mafia, Fred would be a made man. <laughs> Come on up here real quick. And uh, we've been singing about how good God is. Amen. And Fred Amen. and Janet came here today just to brag on Jesus and celebrate mm -hmm. all that God is doing through game day Amen. over Amen. at North Andrews Elementary School. And so... <clears throat> he didn't even tell me he was coming today. He just whispered in my ear up here, I want to see Kelly and just encourage her and tell her how awesome. So I think our church needs to hear that. Will you just yeah, take a minute yeah. and well, brag first on of Jesus? All, first of all, yes, <laughs> it's all about Jesus. It's all about how good God is. Epi Game Day uh, got started in 2019 to be greeted with COVID. So it was really tough to create an outreach for elementary schools. First Priority had been on campus, middle and high school campuses, since 1998. But God led us to do an outreach and try to reach third and fourth and fifth graders back in 2019. So fast forward several years and God has created ample opportunities for us to be on elementary school campuses. And more recently, North Andrews, as God connected a a teacher or a faculty person who comes to your church, uh, and that marriage between church and campus took place in such a very special way this past year. And uh, I've been monitoring this. I, I'm the associate director. We have a director for game day. Her name is Lisette, and she has nurtured the relationship with the school and with the church and, and given guidance and, and training and to hear the stories of how God put things together, how he connected the church and, and the campus, and how out of a meager beginning of just a few students attending, averaging, what, 40 and 50 kids, uh, putting, there's a limit that you can have in our clubs based upon the ratio of volunteers and students and also the capacity of the room. And uh, we, we bumped up against that several times. But God, in his grace and his mercy, allowed us to see such ministry in these kids. And to see it extend coming back to this campus, coming back to this church. As I, I believe Lynn is in uh, the, the children's ministry. She was telling me of uh, what they've witnessed on Wednesday nights, the attendance uh, during covid Nothing really happening on Wednesday nights with kids. And now she's saying 35 students average. And we see some of the fruit of uh, the ministry of game day there. So we're moving forward with game day throughout the, our counties. We're in eight, nine counties now. Uh, first priority is celebrating the fact that we have 320 campus clubs from, thank you, God is good. Got it from Key Largo, one of our newest campuses, all the way up to Titusville. And God has provided uh, for 25 plus years, not only the resources that we need, and, and that's awesome, but the power and the strength and the special bond that we have with the local church. Because we know without folks like you, and the ministry of Grace Point and Pastor Steve, and doing the work of discipleship, we would have no 
connection with, with schools we would have, uh, we, would, we would not be able to exist because we believe that God has uh, established first priority to connect the church to reach the campus for the sake of the gospel. So thank you for your prayers and your ministry and your connection to uh, most recently North Andrews. You've had ministry certainly at Northeast and Rickards over the years. But thank you, Pastor Steve, and we praise God for what he's done. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. God bless you. God bless you. So, Fred, we love you guys. And priority. Uh, we want to pray for them, and we want God to use them. And, uh, Fred, I couldn't help thinking when I was listening to you share about all that God has done. Uh, you know, before Kelly was even with us, Caroline Sewell and other folks were praying, going to that school over a year, just praying. I think Caroline marched around that school like Joshua marched around Jericho, <laughs> although I think she did it more than seven times. But uh, just to see God at work uh, in this community. And uh, Bonnie, you remember um, Bobby Moore, who later married and became Bobby Duncan, Diane Mahidi. Any of you been at Grace Point long enough to remember Diane and Bobby? <clears throat> These two ladies used to come down to this church during the week, and they would meet down here and pray, and they would go all over the building. Sometimes I'd be walking around, and they'd be in the foyer, and they'd just be praying for the doors that people, as they came in, would sense God's Spirit. And they'd come up here, and they'd get on their knees, and they'd pray on the platform, and they'd go pray in the nursery, in the children's wing, and They'd pray in every small group room and walk all over. And I remember one time, we used to have this big, big trailer, like a flatbed trailer that somebody had donated or we were using, and it was sitting out on the back 40 of the church against the fence. And one day I, I came in, and, uh, and I saw four legs dangling b below that trailer. And I drove over, and I saw Bobby and Diane, and they were sitting on this trailer facing away from the church. And i got to be honest, I was a little disappointed in them. I thought, what happened to all your praying and marching all over the campus, and here you are, and I'm just teasing. But I walked over to see what was going on, and as I got within 30 feet of them, I could hear them praying and just chasing down the throne room of heaven. And they were looking at Northeast High School, and they were just praying that God would open up an opportunity. And uh, I want to read you a couple passages of Scripture. We've been reading Ephesians. Most of us are somewhere in Ephesians. If you didn't get one of those booklets, let us know, and we'll try to connect you. we got a reading plan for 28 days, reading through the book of Ephesians. But there, you know, there's two famous passages in Ephesians where Paul prays for those believers in Ephesus. Listen to what he says. Chapter 1. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I wonder if that's God's prayer for you today. That you'd have a spirit of wisdom and revelation that, that, that you would know him better. In chapter 3, he prays another prayer. Listen to these words. He says, now, for this reason, he starts the same way. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established, grounded in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, 
that you may be filled to all the measure of the fullness of God. You think maybe if Paul's prayer for God's people in Ephesus was that they would know him and know him better and know his love. You think maybe that's his prayer for you today. I wonder if there's somebody here today that you just need to know how wide and how long and how high and how deep is his love for you. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Did anybody come here today and you want to hear a great sermon? Anybody want to hear a great sermon? <clears throat> well, you just heard it. Because <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. That Jesus loves me. And let me tell you, the miracle of that statement is not that he loves me. It's that he loves me. This I know. Do you know it today? Bow your hearts with me as we pray all over this room. Oh, we want boys and girls, and we want middle schoolers and high schoolers. We want everybody to come to know Christ. But I'm going to tell you, we want you to know him. We want you to know his love. We want you to know him better because of being here today. Maybe you're listening online, wherever you are right now. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we just pray you would come and do your work in our hearts and in this place today. Father, speak to us. Draw us near to yourself. You said if we draw near to God, he would draw near to us. So Lord, bring us close. Bring us near today. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Father, we pray that you would give strength and you would give hope. And Lord, you would give help. You would show us purpose and direction and Lord, show us that you're the way and the truth and the life. And for somebody here today that needs to know the way, Father, show us the way. For somebody who needs to hear the truth, maybe confused, maybe searching, that Lord, today they would see Jesus is the truth and the truth can set us free. And Lord, for folks that are here today looking for life, we pray, Father, they would find the bread of life, the light of the world, the resurrection and the life, that they would find life in Christ. So Lord, our prayer today is your prayer that we would know you and make you known. And Lord, as we continue to sing and as we worship and everything that happens on this campus today, Lord, that it would just help people come one step closer to Jesus in whose mighty name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Let us continue in worship.
coming after me There's no way you won't get down Lie you won't get down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't
I wish that would have kept going for a little while. In fact, I feel cheated, Jay. Maya's out of town today, and our buddy Jay, who used to play bass for us and sings, he's one of my favorite singers. I thought I was going to get to hear him sing. But uh, you guys appreciate him for being here today. God bless you, brother. And uh, you're not going to make me mad if you sing at the end, okay? No. <laughs> All right. We love you. Appreciate you so much. Pray for Maya and his family, and we'll, uh, we'll be excited to see them again next week. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 11 through 22 this morning. <clears throat> Carol Joe Larson is sitting down close to the front. And uh, Carol, I, I remember uh, after you'd been coming to our church for several years, it wasn't like you were brand new or anything, but I had never heard the story of how you found our church. It was several years later, and we were talking, and uh, she said she got up on a Sunday morning, and she was heading to church, and she drove past our church, and she was on her way somewhere else. And she said she felt like the Lord just told her, turn around and go to that little church on the corner. And she did. And she said when she walked in the room, I'm paraphrasing here, I don't remember your exact words, but it was something to the effect of, she just walked in and immediately, it was like she could hear the words, welcome home. I think it was the gospel according to Dorothy, who said, anybody want to do a responsive reading with me? Let's join together, are you ready? There's no place like home. There's no place like home. It was the great theologian John Bon Jovi who said, <clears throat> Lisa Bowers back there, you look almost too excited to hear about John Bon Jovi. Mark, you better keep an eye on that, okay? <clears throat> John Bon Jovi famously said, who says you can't go home? Who says you can't go home? Well, it was a novelist by the name of Thomas Wolfe who famously said, you can't go home again. Thomas Wolfe is a famous writer in American history. He was a contemporary of William Faulkner. Uh, famous authors have imitated and admired his work uh, Thomas Wolfe was a fascinating person. One of the things that was interesting about his writing, like most writers, he had a really hard time getting his first novel published. He went to dozens and dozens of different houses. He finally found an editor, and his editor said, this book is too long. And they cut 60,000 words out of the novel, Look Homeward, Angel. It was a, basically a kind of an autobiographical, fictionalized story of his own life, his childhood in Asheville, North Carolina. Alcoholic father, uh, religious mother, ran a boarding house, a community with poverty, racism, uh, so, many, so much death and despair. Tuberculosis ran in the family. It would actually take Thomas Wolfe's life before the age of 40. By that time, he was one of the most famous writers in the world. <clears throat> but when the editor took almost one-fifth of his book away and published it, uh, he, became a, he became a famous man. Look Homeward Angel is a coming-of-age story. It's a story of this young man and where he came from. And the reason it's called Look Homeward Angel was because there was a famous angel statue that was a centerpiece of the book and kind of a, a, a thematic element that was based on a real angel statue that was in the boarding house that his mother ran. So when people would come up to the place, they would see this beautiful statue of an angel overlooking them and welcoming them, welcoming them home. A weary traveler being able to, to see the face of that angel and, and know that there was going to be a place of comfort and Warmth and blessing. Look homeward, angel. Well, what the problem was, like most writers who are famous and 
talented and gifted, Thomas Wolfe knew that the, his authentic voice was sharing the truth, his story. Do you know what happened to Thomas Wolfe when he wrote Look Homeward Angel? He became very famous everywhere except for Asheville, North Carolina. Because in Asheville, he was now infamous. Because everybody knew who these characters were based on. And they were less than flattering portraits of his family and his friends. And do you know, Look Homeward Angel was his first novel. The title of his last novel was You Can't Go Home Again. Because never again could he walk through the streets of Asheville without literally being hated or despised. There's no place like home. And, you know, for many people today, <clears throat> they want to find their way home spiritually. How many of you believe that the church is not like a family? The church is a family. That part of, of coming to Christ is, is finding your way home. And there's a passage of Scripture that I'm going to show you today. If you'll look at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, we're going to see how people far from God can find their way home. Maybe you're listening online. Maybe you're not aware that, have you ever heard about heaven having those streets paved with what? Gold. How many of you know that there's a yellow brick road in heaven? And I'm going to show you three road signs on that yellow brick road to heaven that point towards home. Listen to what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. He says, now therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. What was it that separated Jew and Gentile? It was something that was physical. That, that circumcision was a symbol that it was us and them. And guess what? If you're a Gentile, who's us? Who's us if you're a Gentile? Gentiles. And who's them? Jews. Incidentally, <clears throat> if you're white... Who's us? White people. Who's them? Everybody else. If you're black, who's us? Black people. And who's them? Everybody else. If you're an American citizen, who's us? Other Americans. Who's them? Everybody else. In other words, anybody that's not like me, we put them in a, in a bucket called them. And isn't it interesting that they were labeling people? He says, those who are called uncircumcised. Friend, be very careful what you call people. Because the moment you put a label on them, it, 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 it dilutes, it corrupts, it perverts the dignity of a human life. They say there's three classes in America. In fact, I'm convinced when it comes to race, the most important color is green. Now, I'm going to tell you, the dividing line in this country has a whole lot more to do with what you have in your bank account than what you look like on the outside. People say there's two justice systems, one for rich people and one for poor people. O.J. Simpson passed away this week. Do you remember the O.J. case? Friends, the O.J. Simpson case and people's reaction to it didn't change the way we looked at each other. The O.J. case didn't change America. All the OJ case did was pull a curtain back 
and show the real separation that people have, the way they look at it. You who formerly, he says, <clears throat> we used to look at people based on what was on the outside. We looked at what kind of car they drove. We looked at which church they went to. We looked at what the designer name was on their clothing. We looked at the color of their skin. We could hear the language or the dialect that they were speaking. In other words, we saw people and we put stickers on them. And there was us and there was them. And listen to what he says. He says, verse 12, remember that at that time, you, now all of a sudden, he's not talking about them anymore. He's talking about, he's not even talking about us. He's talking about you. Have you ever had a word from God that went from them to us to me? If God wants to say something to you, believe me, he, he knows how to get your attention. He says, remember formerly you, <clears throat> you were separate from Christ. We just read those verses a few weeks ago that talked about being separated from the life of God. He says, you were separate from Christ. At that time, you were separate, excluded from citizenship in Israel foreigners to the covenants of the promise. He says, you, you weren't connected to Jesus, so you weren't a member of God's house, his family. You weren't a citizen of heaven. And he says, because of that, you were an alien, you were a stranger, you were a foreigner to the promise of God. See, the reason you need to know Christ is so you can be a believer, you can be a Christian. You can be a part of God's family. The reason you need to be a part of God's family is because only people in God's family get to experience his promises. He says, you were separate. You were excluded. He says, you were, you were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Look at the end of verse 12. Are you ready? Without hope and without God in the world. Can I tell you, those are three problems. To be without hope. Can I get an amen? You ever been without hope? To be without hope <clears throat> and to be without God. Doesn't that imply that there are some people without hope, but they have God? Let me tell you something. You are infinitely better off, even if you're hopeless, if you have God. Because as long as you have God, he can solve that hope problem. They are without hope. They are without God. Are you ready for the third strike? Three strikes and you're out. In the world. They were in the world. Did you know the phrase that is used in Ephesians more than any other phrase? In fact, I think it's used more than any other book of the Bible. The words, in Christ. In Christ Jesus. In him, 35 times in six chapters, we hear those words, in Christ. Friends, you are either in Christ or you are in the world. Do you remember Dorothy on the Yellow Brick Road? Do you remember her fellow travelers on the Yellow Brick Road? Who were they? Scarecrow, what was his problem? He didn't have a brain. What about the tin man? He didn't have a heart. What about the cowardly lion? He didn't have courage. You know what the Apostle Paul would say about being lost without Christ, without hope, and without God in the world? He says, listen, if you think your biggest problem is that you don't have a brain and you don't have a heart, and you, don't have, you lack courage, let me tell you something. Try living without hope and without God in the world. Now, are you ready for the good news? Look at verse 13. 
Here comes the good news. But, everybody say but. Everybody's got one. But in this verse, it's good news. He says, but now, aren't those great words? Are those powerful words? Friend, those words are like heat-seeking missiles that jump out of this passage, that launch into your mind. But now, in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in Christ? What's the first road sign we're going to see on this yellow brick road to heaven? In Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, far off, like that prodigal son in Jesus' parable, living in the far country, He says, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Can I tell you what I love about this passage of Scripture? This passage of Scripture and this verse, verse 13, verse 13 basically summarizes the whole passage from verse 11 to 22 because the passage, like the verse, begins with people far away from God and ends with them near and close and in Christ Jesus. How can people far away from God find their way home? Number one, write this down. If you have your little half sheet, you can jot this, fill in the blanks. Number one, you need to understand, here's what the first road sign says on the way to heaven. The gospel is a welcome The gospel of Jesus Christ is a spiritual welcome mat. All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen to what he said, Jesus, in Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus tells a story about a master who's going to have a banquet. And instead of sending letters to the Galt Ocean Mile, Instead of targeting his direct mail at people whose giving unit potential was going to help build his church, what did Jesus say in Luke 14, 23? The master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes. If you were raised in church like I was, this verse says in your mind, go out to the highways and the hedges. Go after the people that are far away from the banquet table. Go out to the roads, the country lanes, and what? Compel them, plead with them, beg them, urge them to come in so that my house will be full. Friend, we're the only club in North Andrews that exists for people who are not members of our club. Our whole reason for existing is the people who are not here yet. Friends, welcome home ought to be something that we say every day of the week, and it's something we ought to say every Sunday morning. In fact, we have a team at our church. Where's Joy? Joy Sisk, wave your hand back there. Joy leads our first impressions team, and uh, the first time somebody walks on our property, When I drove on our property this morning, you know the first thing I saw? The first impression I had of Grace Point Church was Randy Rogers standing out in the parking lot smiling and waving me in. And I mean just driving onto the property, the first impression I had was, this seems like a friendly place. When you come through those doors, what do you want to hear? What do you want to sense? Listen, people never remember what you say. Salesmen will tell you this. People don't remember what you told them. People remember how you made them feel. Think of your favorite teacher when you were a kid. Can you picture them in your mind's eye? I don't remember one thing Mr. Schmidlin ever said. I just remember that we had to stand whenever an adult entered the room to show our respect. That we were kids and they were adults. If another teacher walked in the room 
in Mr. Schmidlin's civics classroom at Sunrise Middle School, every kid in that room would immediately get up and stand at their seat while that adult spoke to him or did what they were doing. I don't remember one thing that man ever told me, but I'll tell you this, I learned a lot about citizenship in that class. The gospel is a welcome mat. When you interact with people, do they walk away feeling like, hey, I'd be welcome there. There's a place for me. I belong here. If you're here this morning or you're watching online, let me tell you something about Jesus. He loves rich people and poor people and tall people and short people and skinny people and non-skinny people. <clears throat> he loves smart people and not so smart people. And everything in between. He loves black people and white people. And I wore this shirt today because listen, if there were polka dot people, he'd love polka dot people too. He just loves people more than anything. And you know what? Character is determined by what you care about. And you know what he wants us to be? He wants, to be? he wants us to be a living, breathing, walking, talking, praying, serving, loving, spiritual, welcome man. People, you know what a lot of people will say in their relationships or in business, <clears throat> whether it's personal or professional, nobody wants to be a doormat. Isn't that a dirty word? That guy treats me like a doormat. What do they think of me? Do you, you, am I supposed to just be a doormat? You're going to walk all over me? Can I tell you? A doormat may be dirty. But I'll tell you this. If it welcomes people and helps them find their way home. It can be a beautiful thing. I'm not telling you that Jesus wants you to let people walk all over you. Um, but he did say, if they ask you to go a mile, just go too. If they ask for your coat, give them your cloak, give them, give them everything you've got, give them more than they asked for. What, what is he saying? He, he's, not, he's not giving psychotherapy. He's not giving relationship advice in a sense of control and manipulation and abuse. He's not talking about that. He's just talking about realizing that other people matter to God and that God wants to use me to welcome people into his family. And if sometimes that means being mature enough that I can say, you know what, I don't have to get the last word here to show the love of Christ. I'm going to tell you the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, all those beautiful, wonderful words that make great Hallmark cards. But can I tell you where the fruit of the Spirit ends? The last word? The first word may be love, let me tell you what the last word is, where it really comes down to the, to the brass tacks. It's self-control. <clears throat> and you know what self-control means? It, the, the idea is that you're willing to submit. I, I don't have to win. I don't have to have the last word. I don't have to get my way. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about getting abused here, Okay? I'm just talking about being a welcome man for Jesus. I don't know how you got here. Maybe you're like Carol Joe and God turned your car around and brought you here today. I don't know how you found us online today. But I want you to hear these words. You are welcome here. There's a place for you. That's what we got all these grace groups for. We want people to connect Alan, I was so excited this week. I heard you had a great crowd of people on Wednesday night. 
John has started a group. We've got all these different groups meeting, men's groups, women's groups, couples, singles, mixed, morning, afternoon, evening, on campus, off campus. Somewhere in this church, there's a place. Pat, it's not too late to, for people to get connected. Wave your hand back there if you would. Tanya, wave your hand over there. Tanya, you can see one of these folks. You can see me after the service. You want to get plugged in. You want to get connected. We want to help you to know him, to know him better, and to know his love. Friends, the gospel is a welcome mat. Your life ought to be a welcome mat for people on the yellow brick road that people far from God would find their way home. Number two, write this down. Look at verses 14 to 18. In verses 14 to 18, <clears throat> you guys didn't listen fast enough on that first point, so we're going to speed it up here a little bit. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, enmity, warfare. He says, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in, in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their what? Hostility. Friends, the gospel is the only place, Christianity, the church, it's the only place where enemies become friends and friends can become family. You can go from being enemies to being family. How? Through Christ. You remember in those first verses, we saw that phrase, in Christ? Notice, uh, notice in verse 18, he says, for what? Through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So we, we, the gospel is a welcome, Matt. We, we, we welcome people to be in Christ. But number two, write this down. The gospel comes with a house key. And that you can find your way home when you live through him. He came, he preached peace to those who were far away. He preached peace to those who were near. He, he reconciled the two. See, really receiving Christ doesn't just mean that you can have peace with God, but it also means you can have peace with others. How many of you know that one plus one equals two? Pretty simple, right? One plus one equals two. Two. But how many know one plus one plus one equals one? Jonathan's giving me a look like the rock with the little eyebrow raised. How is one plus, if one plus one equals two, then how is one plus one plus one equal one? Because if it's can I borrow you for a minute? Alan, would you stand up for just a quick minute? Jay, can I borrow you for just a quick second? Now, what I want you to do is, these guys are on opposite sides of the room. Would you both take a step towards me? Will you take one more step towards me? Will you take one more? One more? What's happening? Yeah, they're not just getting closer to me but they're getting closer and closer to each other. You guys can sit down. Weren't they wonderful? Thank Vanna White and her <laughs> com com compatriot. Isn't that what marriage is? Doesn't the Bible say the two? What's two? One plus one. The two become one. So how does one plus one equal one? Because you got to add Jesus to the formula. You got to add him to the equation. See, if, if man and wife are going in opposite directions, they're not getting any closer together by following their own desires, their own wisdom, their own plans, their own agenda. What is friendship? Isn't friendship the same concept? Friendship is the same concept. It's platonic 
It's like a platonic marriage in a sense. I don't mean literally. But, but what is friendship? Friendship is one heart living in two bodies. One plus one plus Jesus. One plus one plus one equals one. Friend, the closer we get to him, the closer we're going to be to each other. Incidentally, does that mean we're always going to agree about everything? No. In fact, genuine friendship is when two people can have the same heart, but a different idea or opinion, and it not upset their fellowship. I don't agree with Bonnie about everything. I don't agree with my parents about everything. I don't agree with Paul about everything. I don't agree with anybody about everything. Listen. You see what I mean? Listen, I don't agree with myself about everything. I've been known to change my mind in mid-sentence sometimes. Friendship, relationship, intimacy. It's not everybody having the same opinion. If, if everybody's got the same opinion, some people are unnecessary. The differences, the conflict, the temperament, the experience, all those things that on the surface seem like they're going to draw us away from one another. The reality is those are the things that bring us closer together when they're resolved, when they're communicated, when they're expressed. Enemies can become Friends, strangers can become friends. Friends can, can become family because the gospel comes with a house key. Look at that last verse, verse 18. He says, through him, we both have what? Access to the Father by one spirit. The word access is a beautiful word. Look at Romans 5, 1 and 2. Maybe the more famous verse that talks about having access to God. Look at what it says in Romans 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. Through whom we have gained, say it with me, access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. That word access literally means to come with, to come near. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. We have access by faith in this grace in which we now stand. Through him we have access to God. And that access provides peace. That we may boldly approach the throne of grace to find mercy and help in time of need. Same word picture. To come near, to approach. How many of you know there's three different kinds of communication? Three different kinds of communication. There's head to head. There's face to face. And there's heart to heart. Have you ever been having a conversation with a teenager and you're face to face? But you're not heart to heart. You have a conversation. How about, have you ever had a conversation with somebody that you were writing love letters to that lived a thousand miles away from you and you got on the telephone with them? You weren't head to head. You weren't even face to face. You couldn't see them. This was in the days before FaceTime and Zoom meetings. And you could be heart to heart. Anybody ever stayed up all night long talking to somebody on the phone? And you looked at your clock and you realized we've been talking for five hours? That ever happened to you? Can I ask you a question? Do you remember one thing they said?
do you remember how you felt? Friends, the gospel comes with a house key. Dan is here today, and he and his wife Sue shared their testimony at our lunch a few weeks ago, and Sue shared a story about how so many people, they have a relationship with the church, but they don't have a relationship with God. They know all about God, but they don't know God. She said, I, I, I used to think of God or Christianity as if it was a car that was in my garage. I could tell you all about it. I knew what color it was. I knew how fast it would go. I knew what kind of seats it had. I understood everything about it, and it was mine. I, I, it was my car. But what if you had a car, but you didn't have the key? that would ignite the engine and start the car and allow you to go and travel. Friends, heaven is a yellow brick road. There's a sign on that road that says the gospel is a welcome mat. There's a second road sign that says this, the gospel comes with a house key. And that key, that access to God is by faith. Access. Didn't Adam and Eve walk in the garden in the cool of the day and they could talk to the Lord as a man talks to a friend? Heart to heart. Wasn't Joseph, I mean, excuse me, wasn't Moses in the tent of meeting and he met with the Lord and Joshua would stay in the tent because he just wanted to be in the presence of God where he would speak to the Lord as a man, speaks to his friend. When Joshua came out of the tent of meeting, People could see it on his face. You know how when a woman is pregnant, literally, you can look at their face and it like radiates this joy and beauty. Because they can't they can't help it. It's involuntary. The Bible talks about that kind of experience with Joshua just being in the presence of God, heart to heart. Can I ask you a question? When was the last time you got up close and personal with the Lord and had a heart-to-heart talk with Jesus? Have you ever heard people say, we need to have a come-to-Jesus meeting? You know what's funny about that phrase, what the irony of that phrase is? When people say they're going to have a come-to-Jesus meeting, what does it normally mean? It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. It's getting a hold of somebody so you can get them to do what you want them to do. Isn't that what a come to Jesus meeting is? You have a come to Jesus meeting with that person means you gave them a tune up. But Isaiah said a different kind of meeting. He said, come. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sin be as scarlet, I'll make it white as snow. Though it be red like crimson, I'll make it as pure as wool. You know what he was saying? He was saying a come to Jesus meeting is when people understand the gospel's a welcome mat. The gospel comes with a house key. And coming to Jesus means people far away from God can find their way home. Finally, look at verses 19 to 22, and we're done. Verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners. Remember how we started out? Separate, excluded, foreigners, far away from God. Look at verse 19. You're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. Does that sound good? Now, are you ready for it? Don't miss this. It's one thing for a stranger, a foreigner, to become a citizen. And by the way, isn't that a beautiful thing? Is there anybody here a naturalized citizen? We got any people that are naturalized citizens? Right? Isn't that a beautiful thing? He says, it's one thing for you to go from being an alien, a stranger, a foreigner, 
to being a citizen. But that's not just what the gospel is. Oh, it's a welcome mat. It comes with a house key. Let me tell you, let me tell you something. Here's the, here's the meaning. The gospel provides a seat at the table. The gospel doesn't just allow you to get into the voting booth. The gospel allows you to come sit at Thanksgiving dinner. It allows you to get into the kitchen and be at the table with the family. Listen to what he says. Now you're no longer foreigners, but fellow citizens with God's people. And also, say it with me, members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Go back to verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. You remember in the first few verses, we saw that phrase, in Christ? And then in the next few verses, we saw that phrase, through Christ? Notice in verse 20, he says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ. On the road to heaven, there's a sign that says the gospel's a welcome mat. There's a billboard that says the gospel comes with a house key. He gives you access. It is in Christ. It is through Christ. Let me tell you about the Christian life. The gospel provides a seat at the table. Let me tell you what makes it so beautiful. It's not just that you're in Christ and through Christ, but that you are with Christ. We've been raised up together with him. We've been made alive together with him. We've been seated in the heavenly realms with him. Do you understand? That's what makes life worth living. You can live in the world if you're in Christ. You can live through difficulty and adversity because you can live through Christ. You can live with pain and sickness and difficulty and questions and doubts and fears. Friend, you can live with all that stuff if you're living with him. Listen to what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Verse 7. 2 Samuel 9 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. If you've never read this story of uh, David and Mephibosheth, you've got to read that story. I mean, for one thing, you should learn how to pronounce Mephibosheth. I was trying to look up that verse. I couldn't remember what chapter it was. And so I used my phone and I put my microphone on and I said, Mephibosheth. Try that today. I tried it many, many times before I broke down and typed in M-E-P-A, Mephibosheth, this crazy guy, this crazy story. David becomes king. You know, the first thing David says, is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? The servant said to him, to the king, he said, oh yeah, there, there's a descendant of Saul. There's a, there's, a, there's a guy that's a member of the house of Saul, but he lives in Belglade. He lives out in the sticks in a shack with a dirt floor. He lived in a place called Lodibar, which was just a way of saying, He didn't have a choice. And he was crippled in both feet. He was in the world. He was without hope. He was without God. He was far away from the palace 
in Jerusalem. Is there anybody left that I can show grace? That I can show? It's one of the most beautiful pictures of grace in all the Bible. Listen to what it says in 2 Samuel 9, 7. He says, send for him. Bring him here. They bring Mephibosheth. By the way, Mephibosheth is a descendant of Saul. Now, if you were Saul's grandchild and King David called for you to bring you to the palace, what would you be thinking you were going for? You were walking into a firing squad. You were going to the guillotine. You were going to be hung in the city square, right? Because of Saul and his persecution of David. Saul tried to assassinate David. Send for him. And when Mephibosheth comes into David's presence, listen to what he says. Don't be afraid, David said. For I will surely show you kindness. For the sake of your father, Jonathan, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your... Are you listening to these words? These are not just words on a page. Listen to what this must have meant to this man. Who was his grandfather Saul? The king of Israel. You know, the queen of England is one of the richest people in the world. How would you like somebody to say, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just give you everything that belongs to the queen. Could you do all right there? When you go to McDonald's, could you supersize your meal, not worry about it? You know what? Give me the extra large uh, shake today. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, Are you ready for the last sentence? Because I'm going to tell you something. To me, it's far more telling. It's far more impactful. It resonates with me on such a deeper level. He says, listen, I'm going to give you all the stuff that you've been missing out on. Let me tell you the real picture of grace. And you will always eat at my table. He didn't say, you can eat the same food as me. He said, you're always going to be with me. And you know what's interesting about sitting at the king's table? I've been to the Holy Land, but nobody's ever seen the dining table from the the temple in Jerusalem or the, 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 the palace that David built that Jonathan built, that Solomon built, excuse me. All I know is it was the king's table. So it must have been impressive. You know what would happen to a crippled man sitting at the king's table? Nobody would see his feet. If he always ate at the king's table, He would just look like another member of the royal family. He said, but Pastor Stephen, I'm lame in both feet. Oh, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem the rest of his life. And he was always at the king's table. And the Bible says, and he was lame in both feet. Oh, he was broken. He was a broken man in a broken world, but he had a seat at the table by the grace of God. Let me tell you something. You may be far away from God today, or you may just feel far away from God. You may be without hope, but you're not without God. You just, you're, you're not so far from God. You just feel far from God. Or maybe you're here today, and you're without Christ, and you're without hope, and without God in this world, and you are far away. Let me tell you, there's a yellow brick road that leads all the way to heaven. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a welcome mat. It comes with a house key, and it provides a seat at the table if you would receive this grace that he offers. You know, Thomas Wolfe said, you can never go home again. After he died, one of the things that was so interesting Remember I told you that his editor had to take 60,000 words out of his first novel to get it published? 
They didn't think anybody would read it. It was longer than Gone with the Wind, and nobody had ever heard of it. On the 100th anniversary of Thomas Wolfe's birth, a, a professor of literature at a prominent school in the Northeast who studied Faulkner and Hemingway, he was an expert on F. Scott Fitzgerald, he discovered in research, he found the original manuscript of Look Homeward Angel with all those 60,000 words still intact. And he edited that manuscript and with permission in 2000 on the 100th anniversary of Thomas Wolfe's birth, they republished his first novel in its entirety from the original manuscript. But it wasn't called Look Homeward Angel. It was the original title that Wolf had given it. Have anybody here ever heard of the book Look Homeward Angel? Did you ever read that in high school? When they republished it, it was called O oh, Lost, the story of a buried life. How many of you think that editor knew what he was doing when to sell books? He called it Look Homeward Angel instead of what it really was about, which was about being lost and trying to find your way home. The story of a buried life. Can I tell you this? The gospel of Jesus Christ is a welcome mat. It comes with a house key. It provides a seat at the table. And I'm going to tell you this about the Jesus story. It's the story of a buried life. But it's not your life. It's his. That God demonstrated his love for you. And that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. He was buried. And that's why the Bible says, we are buried with him in baptism unto death but then we are raised to walk in newness of life. Amber's going to get baptized today. Pastor Paul and Amber, you guys can go ahead and get ready. <clears throat> you guys want to go ahead and get prepared. They're going to get baptized. And friends, when a person is baptized, it's not a token cleansing. It's not a spiritual bathtub. It's a spiritual grave site. It's a picture of a person spiritually being buried and being born again. Let's bow our heads and pray. With our heads bowed all over this room, our eyes closed. If you're online and you're listening to me, wherever you are right now, I just want to ask you a simple question. Are you in Christ? Friend, you're either in him or you are in the world. You are either in or you are out. If you have never received Christ, if you're without hope and without God in this world, today, would you hear these words? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And just call on him today. You say, Pastor Stephen, I don't know what to say. I wouldn't know how to pray. Just say, Jesus. Just call on his name. As if to say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me. Change me. The best I know how, I put my life in your hands. Jesus, come into my heart. Come in today. Come in to stay. Just come into my life, Lord Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer. You're struggling. You say, Pastor Stephen, I feel far from God. I'm going to tell you, he's only a prayer away. Would you come to him right now? Would you have a come to Jesus meeting? Come, let us reason together. Though your sin be as scarlet, they can be white as snow. You can be in him. You can live through him because you live with him.
Father, we pray that you would seal these words in our hearts. Lord, remind us today of your goodness and your grace and help people far away from you find their way home. For Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray, everybody said, amen. Amen. said amen god bless you and be seated you guys might want to just move out of the way a little bit can we keep that mic on oh. give me a favor just uh, turn that back on if you would paul wait one just quick second and i'm going to give you this see if that'll help just speak up well, a couple of weeks ago we partook of some symbols of the blood and the body of christ baptism it's also a symbol, a symbol of a changed heart. God's done the work in Amber Clark's life already uh, through a medical crisis. She's feeling lonely, without hope, fearful, insecure. And I spoke to her, and she said, I need a right decision. And in Christ, with Christ, mm. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your son Jesus Christ and your indwelling spirit in our lives produces that change the in with Thank you for Amber and her testimony, a radiating change in her life because mm -hmm. of your joy and peace. Give her grace and power in her days ahead. Let her experience joy as she is a living testimony of the hope of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> Well, I don't know about you, but I'm glad I stayed till the end. And uh, Jay, one more time, let's say thank you and all of our worship team. Thank you guys so much. <clears throat> Jay, the next time you come, you better sing, all right? Or we're going to have a problem. But well, we love you. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget, it's not too late to get connected in a small group. It's not too late to get a book, to do the daily reading, to be a part of this. We'll be back together again next uh, Sunday morning as we continue through the book of Ephesians, talking about one love that changes everything. Hope you'll be here, bring a friend, 
If you're new, we've got a welcome bag for you. Stop by the table and get that. If, you haven't, if you're new in the last few weeks, you haven't gotten one, stop by there and do that. If you prayed today to receive Christ, we have a special gift just for you. We've got a booklet and a little bag we want to give you. So if you prayed that prayer to accept Christ and you're here, stop by that table. We want to pray for you, encourage you. Wes and Jack are in the back corner. If you want somebody to pray with you and pray for you, you can do that before you even leave today. If you're online, we ask everybody to connect. You can go to gracepoint.net, click on the word contact in the upper right-hand corner. It's like an electronic welcome card. We've got welcome cards here in the room. If you fill one of those out, we've got somebody holding one up right here. You can drop it in the box in the back. If you're a part of our Grace Point family, you can give your offering in the box on the wall. You can go to gracepoint.net, click on the word donate or give. It takes 30, 60 seconds. And every time you give, you're helping change the world one life at a time for the glory of of God. Pat, did I leave anything out? We good to go? Let's all stand together. We're going to be dismissed with a word of prayer. And uh, we're so glad you were here today. And let me tell you, before you leave, I hope three people say to you, welcome home. So be sure to help me do that, okay? If you see somebody you don't know, just welcome them. Say, we're glad you're here. Father, seal these words in our hearts. Use this church to be a welcome mat for heaven. God, help us to see that you have given us the keys to the kingdom. Thank you that your your message comes with a house key, that we can have access to God by faith in Christ because of your grace. Lord, thank you that every person that names the name of Christ has a seat at the table, that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that our name is on that reservation list for the great marriage supper of the Lamb. Thank you that our future is secure, our past is forgiven, and our present is in Christ. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.